The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now I should like to introduce a representative of our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Your future is his business. Security in years to come for you, your home, and your family. Yes, your future is in good hands when you entrust your life insurance program to a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I understand that about 10 million people are listening to my voice right now. Well, at least half of them want to be mothers and fathers. For those 5 million parents, we have a very important message tonight. It's about the Equitable Society special fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Please listen carefully in about 14 minutes when Mr. Keating will be back to tell you more about this fact-finding chart. Available through the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Waterfront Felons. Recently, in a West Coast city, a man was shot down in the street in full view of a woman who happened to be passing by, and also in view of passing traffic. When the accounts of the crime were printed in the newspapers, people all over the nation were shocked at the daring of the murder plan. They need not have been shocked, however, for even as that crime was taking place, others equally as daring were also being committed. And it seems safe to say that still others possibly even more bizarre, were being planned for later execution. Among the seven and a half million people in this country who have fingerprint arrest records, there are many with fertile imaginations and sharp cunning. And they lay their plans as carefully as an army readies an attack on enemy territory. Nor is that comparison to an army merely an idle figure of speech. For these criminals, like an army, have scouts who move in front of them to pick likely places for attack. Scouts who record the movements of a watchman, the chances and best methods of escape, the location of any automatic alarms and how to put them out of order. Those reports are then brought back to headquarters for further study. Criminals who work in that fashion are difficult to apprehend, for they wait patiently and they keep preparing and rehearsing until the proper moment comes. Then they strike. Night's file opens on a large fishing boat which is cruising on one of the great lakes. It is late at night. A heavy fog lays over the water. A group of men are gathered in the cabin of this craft. They are listening attentively as one of their number speaks. I want you to listen real carefully to what I'm going to tell you because I don't want to have to repeat it. Our job tonight is to take a dock. We're coming up to it now. There's ten crates on the dock. They're loaded with cameras. Could be a real good score. Have you all got your diagrams? Yep. Yeah, yeah. All right, look at them. I'm going to hand out assignments. You see the X in the lower right-hand corner there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the ladder we use to get up to the dock. Lou, you climb it. Wait till the watchman comes by. He makes it around to the whole place in eight minutes. Once he gets past, you give the sign. I go up. Then you guys follow. Is that clear so far? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Now look in the center of the diagram. See the circle? That's where the crates are. Uh, Turk. Yeah. You, Shorty, Johnson. Hit the pier and do the loading. Right. And Buck? Yeah. You stay on deck. You operate the crane. It's a new one. Works the same as the old one did, but it lifts twice as much. Williams and Gale will help you unload. You got it straight? Right. Now, if we have any trouble with the watchman, just keep on working. I can handle it. Slim. Yeah. They're coming to the pier. All right, men. Let's go to work. Now, 
Next day at the local FBI field office, agent in charge Medford is seated at his desk as Special Agent Jim Taylor enters. Good morning, sir. I'm Jim Taylor. Oh, good morning, Taylor. Glad to have you with us. Oh, thank you, sir. When did you arrive? Oh, about half an hour ago. Uh-huh. Well, sit down and I'll explain why we had you transferred to this office. All right. Thank you, sir. Now, there's been a series of waterfront thefts recently all along the lake. We're convinced it's been the work of one very well-organized gang. I see. Have any of these thefts come under our jurisdiction? No, not until last night's job. Hmm. They raided a pier, stole ten crates of cameras belonging to the Army. Any identification on these men? No. The few times any of them have been seen, they wore masks. How about the boat, sir? Well, it's been described as a fishing boat. We've checked all registrations. Nothing turned up. Well, sir, wouldn't a fishing boat be a little slow for a getaway? <laughs> from the way they roared away from jobs, I'd say they have a souped-up engine. Oh. We've got a lead on the boat, however. Oh, it's that. The police checked on boats at every fishing village on the North Shore. One boat had been out each night. A dock had been raided, and... Those nights, it had come in without any fish. Wow. Who owns that boat? A man called Slim Wilcox. His captain is one Harry Belmont. They also have a crew. Mm -hmm. Do we know anything about them? Yes, we checked. Wilcox and Belmont have criminal records. Have they been brought in for questioning? No. Why not, sir? Well, several reasons. First of all, their boathouse isn't large enough to hold their loot, so there'd be no evidence. What's more, they've been commercial fishermen for years, so they can justify their boat and their business. I see. Well, what about the cameras, sir? They could be traced through the serial numbers. We've already sent out a list of them, but that'll take time. We just got a break that might lead to a faster solution. Oh, what's that? The diesel oil truck had a minor accident this morning on Route 53. The police picked up the driver, questioned him, and learned that the oil was on its way to Slim Wilcox. Mm. Diesel oil for the boat? I think so, yes. In any case, the man who sold the oil is named Mac Franklin. We've sent a fake message from the driver of the truck saying the delivery would be delayed a couple of hours. That brings us to you, Taylor. You, uh, you want me to deliver the oil? Well, it would be a volunteer job. I know, sir. I'll do it. Good. You stand for me, sir? Yes, come in. Gene Douglas, Jim Taylor. Oh, hi, Douglas. Jim. Glad to know you. Sit down, Douglas. I, uh, I've just been briefing Taylor on those dock jobs. Oh. Sir, uh, I assume Slim Wilcox has never seen the driver of the oil truck. No. Apparently, this Franklin hires drivers on a one-shot basis. Gives them a stolen truck. When the oil is delivered, the driver ditches the truck. Mm. Now, when you deliver the oil, I want you to try to find some way of getting into the Wilcox organization. I understand, sir. Uh, now, where do I find Wilcox? He's in a village called Jamestown. We've gotten Douglas here. Job as a clerk in a cigar store up there. Huh? You'll communicate with the office through Douglas in the store. Yes, sir. Well, now go get some old clothes, and we'll arrange to have you pick up the truck. All right, sir. And, uh, by the way... Danny Gray is the truck driver's name. From now on, Taylor, it's your name, too. Slim. Just got a call from Sandoval. Now, what's with the truck? Got through, fine. Any deal on the cameras? Yeah. The uh, fence off at 8,500. That's uh, not enough. Yeah. Come in. Come in, Buck. What is it, Buck? There's a guy outside. Well, who is he? I don't know. All he said is he's got some oil. And I said, what kind of oil? And he said, diesel oil. Oh, that's I... the stuff from Mac Franklin. Oh, Harry, call Centerville. Tell him we want 10 Gs for the cameras. Yeah, sure. Slim, what about this guy? He's got oil. Diesel oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Okay, Buck. I'll see him. You the oil guy? Yeah. There's the truck. Right over by the tank. You Slim Wilcox? Uh-huh. Your tanks are locked. I can't unload I'll them. I'll unlock them. Come on. Okay. This top grade stuff? I don't know. I didn't heist it. So Franklin, we had trouble with the last load, huh? Well, I won't be seeing him. No, why not? It's one way haul for me. When I unload here, I'm going to ditch the truck. Oh. Uh -huh. Uh, you know anybody that could use it? Uh, the truck? Yeah. Uh-uh. Well, you know where the guy could catch on? No. Seems like I met up with a crap game on the way down here, and I got cleaned out. That's too bad. Uh, there we are. Both tanks are open. Um, 
Here's a double saw for you. Should get you out of town. Buck, I didn't want no hand there. Yeah, pay me back sometime. And when you get the oil unloaded, call Buck and he'll let you out. <laughs> You? Yeah, I, uh, I want some pipe cleaners. Yes, sir. Got some right here. Someone in the phone booth, Jim. Okay. Uh, how much are these? Uh, 30 cents. Get a shake for them? Mine? Dice here, 26. You know the game? Oh, yeah. yeah. Cost you a nickel a line. Okay, I'll roll you. What number you want? Oh, uh, sixes. Three and one. Night. Good night. Yeah, that's five and two. How'd you make out, Jim? I delivered the oil. Get a job? No, but I got some information. I, I talked to one of Slim's men. They're getting ready for another job. Yeah, when? I think tonight. Yeah. Any trace of the loot? No. No, and I didn't see any place where they could keep it. Hmm. Well, if they're working tonight, we better put stage two in operation. Yeah, you better cut them. Well, that beats you, bud. Pay up. the man. We're ready to shove off. Okay. Harry? Yes, Slim. What about the truck? We're all set. Now, you know where we make the meet? Yeah, Williamstown Bridge. That's right. Be there at 11.30. If we don't show in half an hour, just pull away. Right. Hey! Hey, you guys! Uh, who's that? I don't know. It's too hey, dark Slim. to see you. No, it's the guy that brought the oil. Slim, I gotta see you. We're busy right now. It's important. Blow, will you? What? We're gonna knock those guys off tonight. What? He said we're going to get knocked off. Yeah. Uh, come here. What'd you say about getting knocked off? The cops are out on the breakwater. They're going to search every fishing boat as it goes through. Where'd you get that? I ran into an old buddy of mine. He's got a way of knowing what goes on with cops. Told me the whole story, so I came right out here. How come you make me such a partner? I owed you one. What? You stake me to a double saw. Okay, I'm paying you back. Hey, Slim, there was a phone call just now from Big George. He said, is Slim gone? I said, I don't know. And he said, if he ain't, stop him. And I said, why? And he said, the cops are at the breakwater. And I said... Yeah, yeah, he... I know, Buck, I know. Uh, well, he said, when the cops finish out there, they're going to go through every boathouse on the shore. What for? Big George said, for boats with diesel engines in them. And I said, like ours? And he said, yes, and... I said, what should we do? Okay, Buck, okay. Uh, Harry, go cut off the motor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Buck, go get Joey. Tell him I want the motor taken out of the boat. Joey ain't around, Slim. What? He's out heisting a car for us to use tonight. Oh, yeah, that's right. You, uh, you need some help? What? I can get that motor out for you. A big diesel? Yeah. I did the same job two years ago in Detroit. Took the whole thing out inside of an hour. You get a yard if you can do it now. A hundred bucks don't interest me. And what does? I told you this afternoon. A job. Leave this thing clean and you got one. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now for a quick interview with a man who looks as if he didn't have a care in the world. A man who's going to tell us how he spent ten minutes filling in a fact-finding chart and got rid of a ten-year worry. That's absolutely correct, Mr. Keating. It was as simple as ABC. A, I asked my equitable representative for the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. B, he brought the chart and we filled it in. C, right away the ten-year worry started to do a disappearing act. And just what was that worry, Irv? Well, I guess it's one that's only too familiar to almost every father. It's when you say to yourself, if I die while my kids are still young, what happens? What income will my wife need to support them until they at least finish high school? Irv, not one man in 50 really knows how much money his family would need to carry on without him. What they would require to maintain a decent standard of living until the children finish high school. 
That's where the equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers comes into the picture. It gives you a sound and reliable basis on which to figure up the minimum expense. What's more, it's simplicity itself. Every step is made absolutely clear by easy-to-understand illustration. Well, my wife and I really had fun filling it in. And when I got a trustworthy figure, I suddenly realized that there was something I could do about it. My equitable man showed me how to provide for the income my family would need at a price that didn't strain our present budget. One last question, Irv. How much did you pay for that chart? What do you mean, pay for it? Didn't cost a cent. Yes, this chart is just one of many services available from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. It costs you nothing and does not obligate you in any way. Just drop a hint to any representative of the Equitable Society and he'll be glad to see that you get a copy. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's spelled E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Waterfront Felons. Tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation is illustrative of how integral a part danger plays in the daily life of every special agent. The assignment given here to Agent Taylor... The assignment to infiltrate into a gang of thieves is not in itself so unusual as to be newsworthy. For even now, as you sit listening to this program, it is likely that there are other special agents who are likewise trying to work their way into the confidence of other gangs. Discovery of any of them by the criminals they are attempting to trap means almost certain death. Death such as has come to other agents in the line of duty. Because of that possibility... Every special agent being given any such assignment is also given the opportunity of refusing it. For in a democracy, no man in time of peace may involuntarily be given a job which places his life in jeopardy. Knowing that, it also might interest you to know that of the thousands of similar assignments placed before special agents of your FBI since the founding of the Bureau, the record shows not a single instance of any refusal. A record which tells you how unlimited is the devotion to duty of every member of your FBI. Of the lengths to which he will go in fulfilling his oath to protect you, the American people. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office as Special Agent Douglas reports to Agent in Charge Medford. Well, what's the word from Taylor? He contacted me this afternoon, sir. What's he been doing? He reports to Slim Wilcox every morning, hangs around the boathouse till about three, then he's dismissed. Uh Uh-huh. Any uh, regular duties? No, sir. Any sign of them going into action? Well, they put the motor back in the boat, but that's all. Oh, uh, Taylor got a lead on the stolen goods. What is it? I heard one of the mob talking about the truck that took the loot to Centerville. Centerville? Well, that ties in. With what, sir? The police there raided a suspected fence this morning and found the cameras that were stolen from the government dock. Does this fence implicate the Wilcox mob? No, he isn't talking. The police up there don't think he will. Uh, You and Taylor just keep working. Report back to me as soon as there's any definite indication that the mob is going back into action. Hi. Oh, hi, Buck. Where's the rest of the guy? Out back. Know anything about guns? Yeah, some. Know anything about cleaning them? Yeah. Well, that's a job we got to do right now. Uh-huh. Let's get them off the rack. Okay. Hey, that's a real nice one. Slim's got more of them on the boat. Uh-huh. This is uh, kind of like a hobby with him. He stole every one of them. Uh, Buck, does this mean we're going to action? Oh, I don't know. Hi, boys. Oh, hello, Slim. Why don't you ask Slim? Ask me what? Oh, he wanted to know if uh, this meant we were going into action. Yeah, we work tonight. What do I do? You're with Harry. On the boat? No, unloading when we come in. Huh? Where will I be? You'll find out. Well, how'll I know where to meet you? Harry will bring you down in the car. So we'll be here tonight at 8 o'clock. Ready to go. We're 
running a special on these pipes today, sir. Oh, I don't want anything. There'll be anything else? No, no, that's all. All right, that'll be 59. Oh, that. There you are. 59 out of a dollar. All right, that was 59. I'll make 60, 70, 75, and $1. Oh, thank you. Right, sir. Can I help you? Yeah. Uh, oh, let's see. I'd like a couple of cigars. You're late today. It's going to be action. Yeah, when? Tonight. Are you using the boat? Yeah. What time's the job start? I report back at 8. Are you on the boat? No, I'm going to be... Could I have two nickels, please? Yeah, sure. Two. Here you are, sir. Thank you. These, uh, the cigars you wanted? No, it's the next box. Sir. What's your assignment tonight? Unloading the boat. Where? I don't know. Stage three in operation? No, but it will be. You set up? As soon as we hear from you, we'll be ready. Hey, that's seven cars in a row that landed in the hat. No? What time is it, Buck? Uh, 20 to 10. How long do we wait around like this? Our auto, Harry, says we should go with him. Hey, uh, can we close that window? Ah, oh, the air will do you good, Buck. It does me cold. I wonder where we're meeting the boat. How would I know? Hey, look. Hmm? More than half the deck and the hat. And from ten feet, too. Yeah? That's swell. Funny thing about throwing cards in a hat. Makes a real big difference whose hat you're using. Now, you take Turk's hat, for instance. Oh, I, I... I don't mean this for no knock at Turk, but he's got such a little noggin. And if there's ten cards in his hat, it overflows. But Whitey's hat, what a jackpot. He's got a head on him. And... Uh, we gone, Harry? No, not yet. What's with the gun? Ask him. Me? Yeah. And keep your hands out of your pockets. I don't get this. I just finished talking to your old boss, Mac Franklin. Oh? Well, how is Mac? Healthier than you're going to be. What is this, Harry? Franklin called here to see if we got the oil okay. Yeah? And he asked if the guy that drove it down was still around. I said he was. Mac started talking about him. What he said didn't match up with this guy here. Oh. Look, it was probably a rip. Mac is always rip. Look, roll up your right sleeve. What for? Because if you're the guy Franklin sent down with the truck, you got a flag tattooed on your arm. Why don't you do like he says? There's no flag on my arm. I had it taken off. You're a liar. Look, this guy's a fink. Are you sure, Hal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's because I don't like finks. Put them in the car. Take them with us to Crawford's Point. <laughs> Back it up a little. Ah, no, a little more. Yeah, no, oh, that's okay. Try to get up there with the line, tie us off. Huh? Right. Okay, Joy, cut the motors. Okay. Left, left. Yeah, right with you, Harry. Uh, Joy, you can start unloading now. Gotcha. Harry? Yeah. Where's the truck? Right at the end of the dock. Better leave it there. This dock might not hold it. How'd the job go? Oh, great. A little trouble at my end. Oh, what do you mean? Come on down, I'll show you. Show me what? Buck's got him in the car. What? That last guy you hired, he's a fink. How do you know? Mac Franklin called. He ain't the guy that Franklin sent. Must be a cop. Yeah, that's the way I figure. Buck, the guy's still out? Yeah, real cold. Yeah, what are we doing, Slim? Yeah, put him on the boat. When we get up in the bay again, we lose him. Okay. Come on, Buck. I'll give you a hand. 
Let's go. Stand where you are, all of you. Hey, what is this? Turn on the floodlights, men. Cover the dock of the boat. Hey, what's with those lights? Let's blow, Harry. Don't try anything, Wilcox. This whole area is surrounded. Now bring that man you're carrying over here to me. And get that crew of yours up off the dock. You're all under arrest. The entire Wilcox gang was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to long prison terms for the theft of government property. Their roundup brought an end to their career of crime. Agent in charge Medford was able to make the arrests in this case because Special Agent Taylor had planted a microphone outside the window of the Wilcox boathouse. The window he carefully opened on the pretext of getting some fresh air. Special Agent Douglas, listening at the other end on equipment concealed in the rear of the cigar store, heard Taylor struck down. The immediate temptation was to go to his aid and make the arrests of Buck and Harry. But that would not have done the job to which these agents had been assigned. The job of breaking up the whole gang. When Special Agent Douglas heard Harry say that they would take Taylor to Crawford's Point, he knew that must be the point of rendezvous for the truck and boat. One telephone call to agent in charge Medford took care of the rest of their job. And so... Another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was closed. In the process, you have witnessed what you may regard as the extraordinary courage of one special agent. Actually, that is the day-to-day -day courage of every agent. For this assignment merely happened to come to Special Agent Taylor. It could have come to any of the others throughout the country, and they would have done the job as willingly and as completely, would have done it so that it ended as this case did with the arrest and conviction of every criminal. In just a moment, you will hear about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But first, a few words from our Equitable Society representative on the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I'm speaking for nearly 8,000 Equitable Society representatives. Most of us Equitable men are fathers of families. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A topical story of crime in far-off Alaska... Its subject, swindling. Its title, The Frozen Frame-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Tony Barrett, Bill Conrad, Paul Fries, Ed Gargan, George Offerman, Jr., and Roland Winters. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The frozen frame-up on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>